But what if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better? And just for a few minutes before we go into the Word, uh, we have a guest with us. I'm going to invite you up. This is Mr. Bob Vanderlinden. Some of you probably know him from uh, from Dixon, and we went to church together years ago. But I'm just going to turn the mic over to him, and he's going to share something to you that's very important this morning. Thanks, Kim. This is great, isn't it? we got a place to worship. God's here with us. Beautiful music. Hallelujah. This morning I want to talk to you a little bit about the Gideons, and I'm just going to give you a, kind of a quick summary. I promised Kim I'd be out of here by 11 o'clock, so. <laughs> so who are the Gideons? We are business and professional men who, along with our wives, auxiliary, share the word of God with the rest of the world. And a lot of people think that the Gideons are about putting Bibles in motels and hotels and that, and that's what we do. But our main purpose is to help others to come to know Christ. And we do this by distributing God's word around the world in over 200 countries and 100 different languages and that. You know, we do a lot of ministry locally. We do a lot of ministry in the state, in the nation, and around the world. You know, to different organizations and that, such as hotels and motels. That's how the Gideons got started back in the early 1900s. And a couple of gentlemen decided to put, start putting Bibles in, in inns and, and hotels and motels at that time so that people didn't have to carry them with them and they had it, uh, a, a word of God there when they got there. And that's how the Gideons got started. You know, we are on the track right now of over 2 billion copies of God's word since that inception back in the early 1900s. And that motels and hotels, a lot of you have been in there. And my wife and I go into a motel and hotel to stay and that first thing we do is look for God's word in there. If it's there, we open it up, and when we leave, we leave it open on the nightstand and that beside the, the, the bed and that. To medical facilities such as hospitals, nurses, doctor's offices, and places like that, even to patients and that. Now, we don't just lay them there usually. What we do a lot of the time is we distribute them. We hand them out. We pray with people, and we help others to come to know Christ through his word. Hallelujah. You know, to nursing homes. Uh, assisted living homes and places like that, to police and fire, emergency facilities and, and, and the such, and to their workers, you know. And 9-11, you know, we handed out thousands and thousands of copies to people there and that. Uh, firemen, policemen and that included for emergency workers. Our son is a captain in the fire department out in Mount Juliet, and uh, a lot of some of you know who he is and that. But uh, he's, a, you know, he's, a, he's a faithful worker of the Lord out there, too. So, you know, we really appreciate those people. To jails and to penitentiaries and places like that, halfway houses and that. To schools, to fifth graders in school. Any young people here, fifth graders? <laughs> They're in their own church. All right, hallelujah. Well, anyway, we hand out to the fifth graders in the different schools around here. A little testament and that. A lot of you probably received those uh, at that time. You know, um, we, just a quick testimony about that. We, uh, several years ago, I heard a, a lady speak, and she said, I was down. She said, I was out. I was divorced from my husband. I'd had a seven jobs in two years. I had my children taken away from me. She said, I didn't know what to do. She said, I decided to go into the country to commit suicide. She said, as I went into the country, 
as I pulled over and I reached under the passenger seat to pull out the gun to finish that job. And lo and behold, there was a small copy of God's word there that my son had gotten in the fifth grade. She said, I pulled it out and I started reading about it. And she said, as I read about it, I thought, this is, this is really kind of neat. This is really kind of a neat book and that. And she said, I got a hold of my ex-husband's father, who I knew was a Christian man, and we prayed together, and I accepted the Lord as my Savior. That book that my son got in the fifth grade saved my life. Hallelujah. You know, what a great testimony that was when I heard her speak that. And she did it with tears in her eyes and that. She said, I now go around and I teach about God's Word and what it did for me in the ministry and the hazards of drugs and alcohol in your life. You know, to to military personnel, I served two tours flying in Vietnam. And lo and behold, I was, I was raised in a Christian family in Iowa. And I had the Lord in my life. But there's a lot of military people out there today that don't have the Lord in their life, and they need it. So if we can provide them with a copy of God's Word and that to take with them. And we've got testimony after testimony after testimony of these little camouflage-type uh, testaments like this and that that they've carried in their pocket. Uh, they, uh, the old story is they used to use them to roll cigarettes. Some of you probably remember the old roll cigarettes, but they used to, put a, they used to take pages out of them and roll cigarettes because it was about the right size, I guess, to roll a cigarette. I've never rolled one, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, to military personnel. And again, we have testimony after testimony after testimony about how that little book helped save their lives, you know, both physically and spiritually quite often. And, you know, foreign countries, we go to different foreign countries, like I said, over 200 countries around the world in over 100 different languages and spread God's word over there to help others to come to know Christ as their Savior. That's what the Gideons are about, people. And this morning, you know, uh, I told uh, Kim that I would end before 11, so I'm, I'm going to stick to that, okay? So this morning, I'm going to ask you to pray for the Gideon ministry. You know, we're under the attack of Satan, like a lot of them are. And, of course, this year has been a very hard year for a lot of people with the COVID and that around and that. Um, A lot of uh, publishers and and people that we use to print God's word and that have had, you know, restrictions on things. Uh, Churches are not beating and that. And um, a lot of our um, uh, money that comes in for the printing of God's word comes from uh, those types of things. So pray for the Gideon ministry. If there's anyone here that's interested in becoming a Gideon, I'd love to tell you. I'm going to stick around and, and hear Kim preach this morning. But after the service, if you'd, love, if you'd like to talk about the Gideons a little bit more in that, I'm going to be down here and I'm going to be available for you. And I'd love to talk to you about the Gideons, possibly joining the ministry, or a little bit more about what the Gideons are about. And the third thing I want to talk about is what we call our Gideon card program. This is a Gideon card rack. In here, there are a variety of different cards. It's thinking for you, praying for you, uh, on your special day of event and that. Um, is there anybody here that would not like to get a card in the mail, the old-fashioned mail, that said, we've been praying for you? Doesn't that sound kind of, kind of good? Those cards are in here also. This is another way that we raise funds to, to have God's uh, word printed and that to be distributed around the world is through our Gideon card program and that. And we'll find these in a lot of churches. Of course, you guys kind of moving around right now, and that um, and that these are available. Um, they're also available in nursing homes. I mean, excuse me, funeral homes, uh, and that we do sponsor the the, the rack in a, a funeral home, and that for people if you have someone pass away or something. But there's all kinds of cards in here promising, thinking of you on your special day. Somebody has an anniversary or something like that. What a way to do it. Uh, funerals, think about that. You know, you know, a lot of people, they, they go overboard and they spend all these thousands of dollars on flowers and that. And what happens to the flowers? They die. What happens to God's word? It doesn't die. It just don't die. All right? So if you could send a card with a donation in it, that's helping to support others to come to know Christ and that. That's our Gideon card program. And last but not least, as I finish up this morning, just make a donation. Um, if you want to make a donation this morning, um, we'd love to have you do it. Uh, and that, you can take an envelope over here and just designate it for the Gideons and that. Um, uh, Kim and, and, and the group are going to take it after church and, um, and count it and that and give us the donation, and that will be turned in. 100% of the money that comes in from 
giving uh, through the card program, getting through church giving, or just donations and that uh, go to the printing of God's Word. The organization is supported by a person like myself and many others uh, and that uh, around the, the, the county and the state and, and around the world that pay dues every year. And that's what we do to support the ministry. And then we talk about it and the Gideon uh, programs and that go to the printing of God's Word. So 100% of that goes to that. And as, again, as I, as I finish up here, uh, I want to finish the word of prayer. But before I do that, just think about this. And I want you to do this if you can. Raise your hand up. We're going to click our fingers four times if we can. So raise your hands up to my count. One, two, three, four. That was approximately four seconds. In that four seconds, over 10,000 copies of God's word have been distributed by the Gideons around the world. That's a lot of distributions. You know, this year we're, we were hoping to, to actually distribute about 93 million copies of God's Word. It's going to be a little less than that just simply because of the, the issues that we've had this year, you know. And, and again, be praying for those people that are in the ministry. Be praying for the people that uh, have had COVID. I've had COVID, you know. God bless me. My wife is still, uh, she had pneumonia with it, and she's home right now. She wanted to come this morning. Because, again, she knows uh, uh, several of the people in here, but she just did not feel like it. So be praying for those people, if you would. And that. Let's close in a word of prayer if we can. Lord, I just thank you for this ability that you've given me to talk to these people about helping others to come to know Christ through your word, Lord. It is the spiritual word of God. And, Lord, we just thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory and all the thanks for everything you provide for us, Lord. Pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless you, Lord. Well, this morning we are going to be in our word. And in just a few minutes, we're going to move into Philippians. We've been um, in Philippians just off and on for the past, I'd say, four to five weeks. Um, the Lord will lay something on my heart, and then he'll bring me back to this this epistle in the New Testament. But This morning I'm going to be talking about the importance of humility in our lives. But before we move into that, I want to talk to you first about pride. Pride, we know that in Proverbs 16 it says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. We know this verse, we quote this verse. If you, if you know pride is one of the top sins that God hates. It's one of the top things that he hates. You see it all through Proverbs it describes arrogant eyes in Proverbs 6 as one of the seven things that the Lord hates. Pride, it tells us in Proverbs 11, leads to disgrace. Proverbs 18 tells it leads to a downfall. In Proverbs 21, it tells us that haughty eyes and an arrogant heart and mocking of others is an indication of excess pride in our heart. Pride will ultimately humble a person. Scripture says in Proverbs 29, 23, a person's pride will bring him low, but a humble person will obtain honor. It's a, it's a truth from God's Word. If there's pride in our heart, we will eventually be brought low. But if there's humility in our heart, that we will eventually be honored. We will be honored. The greatest example of pride in the Word of God, obviously, is Satan. Satan being created by God, originally being in heaven with the Lord, full of wisdom. Scripture tells us perfect in beauty. He became corrupt. He became violent, wanting to be greater than God. What happened? Pride rose in his life. It says that because of pride, he was cast out of heaven. Pride, from a biblical standpoint, is simply your heart turning inward. Instead of your heart being focused on the Lord, it's your heart then turning inward and being focused on yourself. And most of all, it means not acknowledging that you have a need for God. Not acknowledging God in your life. Not acknowledging that you need the Lord to the point where we seek Him. See, when Satan found out then that he couldn't overpower God, he's been cast out of heaven, he shifts his, 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 plan, his, his um, deception the pride in him, he shifts it towards the children of God. We see this when he came into the Garden of Eden and when he, when he came before Eve and what did he use to trick her besides deception 
and pride. He caused her to question the word of God. Did God really say? He caused her to question what God said. But then he also caused pride to rise in her heart. I want you to see this this morning. The reason I say it's pride is because Eve's eyes got off of the Lord and who he was and what he had said to them. The command that he had given, the only one thing that they had to live by. Her heart got off of that. Her eyes got off of that and got on to herself. I say this because Genesis tells us when the woman saw the tree was good for food, was a delight to the eyes that it was desirable to make one wise. In other words, Eve said, this is the thing that God said, but man, it looks like it would really benefit me. It looks like it would benefit me. I don't think Eve Eve was rebellious. I think she got deceived and pride rose in her heart. All throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, we are warned, warned as the children of God to guard our hearts above all else, for out of it flows the issues of life. But we are warned about pride and the dangers that it causes, that it causes in our life, what it brings into our lives, placing our desires above the Lord's, turning inward, living life for ourselves or just without the help of God. Do you understand? Pride doesn't have to be arrogant or boastful. Pride doesn't have to be ugly. Pride is just simply taking your eyes off of the Lord as the first thing in your life and letting your heart turn inward towards yourself. Humility, it's the exact opposite of pride. Humility, it protects us from pride. Humility, the greatest example that we have of humility is Christ is Jesus Christ. I want to say this to you, and then I'm going to be reading from Philippians chapter 2. Many times when we talk about familiar passages of Scripture, or we talk about things that we, that we don't think that applies to us, or we think, well, that's familiar, we can sometimes tune that out. We can sometimes not allow it to have enough weight in our lives. But the truth is, I think it... it All of us, I don't care who we are, we need to realize the importance of guarding our heart and allowing God to search us to make sure, because I can guarantee you, if you are flesh, there is something that that, that tries to rise in your heart, and it's called pride. We have to be careful that we are aware of it, that we can recognize it, and to know what God's Scripture says about it. We have to be careful that we don't just deflect the words of God when he tells us to be careful, to be warned that pride comes before destruction, before a fall, before falling away from the Lord. I want to pray this morning, and then we're going to move into Philippians chapter 2. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would guide my words. Father, they would be anointed by you. Lord, this is your word. We just heard Bob Vanderland, we just heard him speak about the importance of it, how it's changed lives. We know that it's changed our lives. I know it's changed my life, Lord. It is alive, Lord. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, Father. And Lord, I pray that this morning that this word would pierce our hearts, Lord Jesus. And Lord, that even though it's a familiar passage, even though it's something that maybe we don't recognize in our lives, Lord, I pray right now your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word in our heart. God, and show us what we need to receive from you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in the likeness of 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 human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow every in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should acknowledge or should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, this is Paul talking, but now more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose in your life. This is Paul's writing. He reminds us here, he's writing this to the church. He's writing this to believers. And he's reminding us that we should do nothing out of selfishness or selfish ambition, things that promote ourselves. He said we are not to do that. Instead, we are to prefer others. We are to allow the Lord to promote us in due time. He actually says it this way, think of others more important than you do yourselves. It's a hard thing to do. It's a simple command, but it's a hard thing to do. He's telling us, think of others as more important than ourselves. Do we stop and truly think, how, do my, how does my life affect other people? How do my words affect those in my life? How do my actions and my attitudes and my behavior, how does it affect those in my life? See, many times we think of Christianity and being like Jesus as the aspect of being void of sin. Like we think if I live a good life, a moral life, a faithful life, man, I'm going to heaven because I'm like Jesus. But Jesus was so much more than void of sin. Jesus was full of the love of God, and he was full of humility. We see it over and over in the Word. Jesus wasn't just humble to the point of death on the cross. Jesus' whole life was sacrificial. His whole life was humble. He was so much more than just being void of sin. We're told in verse 5 of Philippians 2, Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant. We know from Matthew 20 that Jesus came to the earth and he said it himself, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Jesus said then, he said, I I, I came to be a servant, to, to stoop down and become a servant. He was the son of God, but he laid down his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says he was rich, but he became poor for our sake. He laid down his deity. He laid down the privileges of heaven. He could have used his power, but he chose to lay that aside and become flesh. He emptied himself. For the sake of others. He gave his life on the cross, which was reserved for criminals. He humbled himself in every way. And then in verse 9, it says, Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. God gave Jesus rule and authority above everything on the earth, under the earth, in heaven. He gave him rule over everything, not just because of his death on the cross. But because of the sacrifice, the sacrificial life, that he humbled himself all along the way. All along the way. We can't get so focused on the death of Jesus, although it's the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus that gives us life and that gives us victory and over the power of hell. But we have to stop and look at the life that he lived when he was on this earth. The way that he walked. We have to understand what it meant when it says in Philippians 8, Jesus humbled himself, becoming obedient to the Father. If we are supposed to be imitators of Christ according to Ephesians, what does that look like in our lives? What does true humility look like for us? To humble ourselves. Humility is not a weakness. It actually requires great strength. Humility is not easy. It's not being a doormat. Humility requires a lot of of strength in your life. To be humble means this, to bring low, to pass over, not because of a lack of worth, but out of a full reliance on something greater. It means to dismiss our dependence on ourself and on our own carnal nature and to place that dependence fully on the Lord. To be humble means we get up in the mornings and we realize I can't make it through this day, God, without you. Like that everything about our lives, I can't make it without losing my temper. I can't make it without living in fear or doubt. I can't make it, Lord, without whatever it is that that, that, that's that weakness in your life. 
Whatever it is that the enemy sets traps for you to get up in the morning and know, God, I am all yours, and I'm going to humble myself today. I'm going to choose to humble myself today to know that I cannot make this on my own. I cannot live today the way you desire for me to live unless I choose to humble myself and to honor you. Ephesians 5, I I referenced it just a minute ago. Verses 1 and 2, this is Paul's writing also. He says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. See, Paul understood the importance of being protected in our heart and in our lives from pride. He understood our need for humility. And he understood that we, needed to under, that we needed to follow the example of Christ. You see it in his writings over and over again. He talks about, he talks about a, a, a unity and he talks about the, the importance of protecting yourself and not thinking more highly of yourself than you should. Now remember, pride and deception lead to a great falling away. Do you know that Scripture tells us that in the last days there will be a great falling away. It doesn't have to mean that people fall deep into sin. It means they fall away from the Lord being their first in their life, and their heart turns inward, and life becomes about them. And the, the Scripture warns us of them uh, of this, not to allow our hearts to be turned off of the truth of God's Word, the promises that He has for us in this Word, not to be turned onto our circumstances, not to be turned onto someone else, but to, to fix your eyes on the Lord. That's what the Lord says. That's what His Word says. Fix, to cement, to keep your eyes at a place where during the day you talk to the Lord. At night or during the day you read the Scripture. You meditate on it. You allow it to just, you can't go a day without some acknowledgement of who He is in your life. That's what it means to humble yourself before the Lord, to be dependent on Him. Romans 12, verses 1 through 3, it says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Worship is not just what we do in here on Sunday mornings, even though I'm glad we get to worship together. Presenting your body As a living sacrifice, the way that you live is your worship to God. The way that you live. This word body here, present your body as a living sacrifice. This is not talking about just the body that you see. There's a flesh inside, a flesh side of you and a spirit side of you. This is talking about everything that involves your flesh. Your physical body, your mind, your emotions, your will your thoughts, your feelings, your decisions, your behavior, all of that is worship to God. So when we take that into consideration and we say, okay, Lord, do my thoughts, do they worship you? Do my thoughts honor you? Do my thoughts show that I love you? Do my words, do my decisions, does it show that I trust you with all of my heart? Romans 12, it goes on to say, Don't let the world shape your mind. Don't let the world shape your mind. Why? Because if you allow the world to shape your mind, it's going to become about you. If we allow the world to shape our mind, it becomes about us. Our mind, our our thoughts get turned inward. Don't allow the world to shape your mind. And then he goes on to say, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. We're told to have the same attitude in us that Christ has in himself. Attitude, this word attitude means an inner perspective. It actually translates to mean a personal opinion, fleshing itself out in actions. Simply put, it's your thought, your thoughts that are seen then in your behavior. You know, I mean, be honest with yourself. When you're just not in a great mood and your mind has not been where it needs to be, you can see it all over your face, can't you? Am I the only one? Like you can see it in your face. You can talk by, you can tell by the way you, you carry yourself. You can tell by the way you talk. <laughs> well, some of you are admitting it. 
<laughs> yeah, he's just like me. He's like, yep, mm-hmm. <laughs> Your attitude. Have the same attitude of Christ. Our attitude. Our thoughts become our behavior. Have the same attitude of Christ, we're told. So what is the attitude of Christ? If we're su- supposed to possess this attitude, what does it look like? What are the inner thoughts that Christ had that was seen in his behavior? We don't know what went on in his mind, but we know what, how he lived his life. It is all over the scriptures, all over the word of God. He laid down his life. He humbled himself. He emptied himself, and he fully relied on the Lord, on the Father. This, this passage of scripture, meaning again, he brought himself low to the point of being a servant, trusting in something greater than he, trusting in in the Father. Because remember, they're one, but he laid down his deity and he trusted the Lord when he walked on this earth. Not because he was weak. Jesus was the strongest person that's ever walked this earth, but he was the most humble person that's ever walked this earth. Humility takes strength. He didn't lay down his life because he was weak. He didn't sacrifice day in and day out, holding his tongue when people persecuted him and mocked him. He did it because of his great love for the Father and for us. And he desires that now our attitudes reflect that same love. Paul goes on in verse 12 of Philippians 2. Then he tells us this. He said, so work out your salvation with fear and trembling, like this is what the Lord has done for you. This is what you can see in his life. He says, so now you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You work it out. So many times we want God to come and fix us. We want God to come and fix it. And scripture so many times is telling us, no, you do this. I'll meet you there. But you have to take that step. You do this, and I'll come in all my glory, and I will meet you, and I will help you. I'll send the helper to help you. Work out your salvation. This this word, work out, in the Greek, in the original translation, it means to work with intensity towards an end result. To work to accomplish an exact conclusion. Do you understand? You go to the, if you go to the gym and you work out, Based on how hard you work out is going to is going to determine the results. Would you agree? Based on how hard you work out, based on how hard you do anything is going to determine the end result. This is saying based uh, to work out your salvation. Salvation is a gift from the Lord, but it says to work out your salvation. Why? What is the end result of your salvation? If the end result for your salvation is to make it to heaven, then we've missed the point of the gospel. The the end result of our salvation is to become more and more like Jesus so that the life that we live on this earth brings glory to him and so that other people can come to know him. That is the end result. Our end result is not just to make it into heaven. I think that people that have this this mindset, I'm just going to skirt into heaven. I've just got to live just good enough to make it in. I wonder if they'll be in the many that thought they would make it, but do not. Because it's about relationship. It's about fulfilling the purpose that God has on your life. Yes, it's to bring glory to God. But you've got a place and you've got a purpose. You've got people that you can minister to that I would never know, that would never come to this church, that their teenagers would never come to youth, that their children would never come to children's church. They may not ever hear the name of Jesus unless you speak it. You've got a purpose and a plan. The Lord says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying, work hard to become like Christ. Live selflessly. Live live sacrificially. Live in a way that loves God and that loves others. That honors God and that others and that honors others. Live like Christ. Is what he's saying here. And when he says, do so with fear and trembling. You know, so many times we've taken this word fear and we've downplayed it. The truth is fear is, is reverence. It is awe. 
being in awe of God, being, I mean, I don't care who you are or what you believe politically. If the President of the United States walked in here right now, we would be like, oh, it's the President. There's an awe because of the position, not the person. The Lord says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, that there should be a respect and an awe for who he is. But in this passage of Scripture, in this particular place, there are other times in the Word of God where fear means to be concerned. It means to be concerned to the point of being fearful, to be afraid. I want you to hear me. This actually means to be fearful, to be concerned, to be anxious. You may think, well, wait, Scripture says be anxious for nothing. You are anxious for nothing as long as you're doing it God's way, as long as you're allowing the Holy Spirit to help you. This is saying work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What he's saying here is work out your salvation, letting the Lord help you, realizing that you can't do it on your own, but having a concern that pride could enter your heart. This is what he said. If you study this scripture out, he's saying work out your salvation with a concern about pride entering your life. We have to be concerned. If you think, well, pride could never, I could never be prideful. That's prideful. I could never do that. I would never. I would be careful. Paul understood the dangers of pride. I said it before. That's why he wrote so much about not thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. That's what he's saying. Don't sit back and say, I would never. Don't sit back and say, that would never touch me. With the help of the Holy Spirit, it will never touch you. By living your life surrendered to God every day, it will never touch you. But if you walk out from under the, this, this umbrella of grace, if you choose to step aside and you become the ruler of your heart and you begin to turn inward instead of depending on the Lord with all of your heart, that's when, that's when we have to be careful. That's when pride comes in. Paul reminds us then in verse 13, he says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, for his good purpose. God is the one that's working in you. If you've said yes to Jesus, Paul told us in the very first chapter of this epistle, he that began a good work in you, he will be faithful to complete it until the day that he returns, until the day you stand before him. He is always going to be working in your life. He is faithful. He is at work in you. It says both to will and to work. For his good pleasure. He's the one working in you. The same work. Same same definition of the meaning. To work. To bring intensity. To energize. He that began a good work. Will be faithful to complete it in your life. He's telling us here to work out our own salvation. With fear and trembling. With the realization that we cannot do this on our own. We can't do it in our own abilities. We have to rely on something greater. And what is greater is the Lord with the help of the Holy Spirit. We do our best and then we leave the the rest to Him. We do our very best to keep sin out of our heart. We do our best to be faithful to what He's called us to do. But there are times where things are going to come up that are out of your control that you cannot help. And the Lord says, let me help you with that. Don't turn inward and try to figure it out. Let me help you. Scripture tells us that he carries us from strength to strength, from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says being transformed. Transformation is a process. Transformation is from stage to stage. Being transformed into the image from glory to glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. We are being made more into the likeness of Christ from glory to glory to glory. The more you know of him, the more you will love him. The more you understand his love for you, the more you're able to give love to others. 
The more you're able to understand his forgiveness for you, the more you're able to give forgiveness to others. The more that you've received of his faithfulness, his goodness, his kindness, his patience, his loving kindness, all these things, the more you're able to extend those to others. It's a process, and it goes from glory to glory, from step to step. He energizes you to, to do the work that he's called you to do. Paul says that God works in us to will and to work. He works in our lives to bring about His will, His purpose, His purpose in our lives, carrying us from one stage to another. But He can only do this if we remain in the attitude of Christ, if we keep the Lord where He needs to be in our heart, meaning if we remain humble, if we keep humility in our heart. Do you know this is, it's, it's not an easy thing. Yes, it's a familiar passage, but I'm telling you, there's a freeing that comes when we take the familiar and we start to live that way. When we start to take the Word of God and we choose every day to live according to this, to put other people before ourselves. To realize how our lives are impacting them. I was going to call the worship team down, but can you turn on some prayer music in a minute? Are you able? If not, you can come down, Matthew. The, the Bible tells us this, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I want you to hear me now. Pride doesn't have to be cocky and arrogant. I said it earlier. Pride is a matter of the heart. Pride is simply not allowing the Lord to have his proper place in our heart. Not being dependent on him in this life. Setting our eyes on other things when they should be set on him. The Word of God is full of warnings about pride. Jesus said He came and He laid down His life so that we could have life and life to the fullest, life, an abundant life. We will miss the abundant life that Jesus died for us to have if we are not aware of the pride that can creep into our heart. It limits the move of God in our life. Now, I want you to see this. We ask God to help us with this, yes. But I want you to hear these scriptures, and I'm closing. Colossians 3, 12. It says, clothe yourself with humility. Clothe yourself. Make the decision to be humble. Ephesians 4, 2. Be completely humble and gentle. You be humble and gentle. God will help you, but you have to start it. You make the decision. James 4.10, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and He will lift you up. Make the choice to humble yourself, to prefer others, to be dependent on the Lord. Philippians 2, 5, 7, and 8. I read it earlier. I'm going to just briefly summarize these. Have This attitude in yourself, which is in Christ Jesus, have means to choose it, to possess it. Do we have the attitude? I'm telling you, do we have the attitude in us that Christ had? Because it takes a lot of strength to get that. It takes a lot of dying and crucifying the flesh for that to be able to come alive in our lives. It's a growing process. He emptied himself of his privileges. He humbled himself and became utterly dependent on his father. Paul tells us that he will continue. The Lord God who started a good work in you will continue to work on you while you're on this earth. When pride rises in our hearts, we crucify that thing. We go back to the Lord. We ask forgiveness. And as we learn, He takes us from stage to stage, from glory to glory, from strength to strength with Him. God gives us the choice as to how we respond to His movement 
in our lives. If we resist him, the process is harder. You know what I mean. When you run from the Lord, when you know there's something in your life and he's putting his finger on it, and you know that it's not supposed to be there, but that pride makes you hold on to it. You don't want to surrender it to him. You don't want to let go of it. Luke 14, 11, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, will be brought down. Those who humble themselves, who bring themselves down before the Lord and honor Him first, will be exalted. Those who turn their focus on their own desires and their own way without acknowledging their need for the Lord, without truly seeking the Lord, relationship with God will be humbled. First Peter 5, 6, and 7 tells us this. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and He will exalt you at the proper time. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Make the choice to make Him the, the King of your heart and to stay dependent on Him. Do we need the Lord in our lives? Like, are we aware that we need Him? That we need His presence in our lives. God wants to use our lives. We read it earlier. For His good purpose, for His good plan. But many times I believe we limit what God can do in us and through us. Because we're not walking in humility. God says, I just want to strengthen you. I want to bring my Holy Spirit. I want my Holy Spirit to be active in your life. so that you can fulfill the purpose for which I have for you. Will you bow your heads this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, I love you, Lord. Father, I know that this is not a, an easy or a popular message, oh God. I know that it's familiar and many times we think, Lord, but it doesn't really apply to us. But Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you search every heart, you test every mind, God. Lord, I was reminded this week as I began to do something without asking for your help. And then as I began to struggle through it, God, I was reminded at that point, you should have asked me for help. You should have been dependent on me. Father, help us to protect our hearts. God, help us not to allow pride to creep in, to sneak in, Lord Jesus, without us realizing it. Help us never to put our desire, God, above you. Help us never to put our, our thoughts above your word, Jesus. Help us never to put our lives and the way we walk, Lord, above the promises that you have for us in your word. Father, your word is life. So, God, I pray that we take every bit of your word and we apply it to our lives. We don't just read it. We live it. We choose it, God. So today, Lord, I ask that we would choose to have the same attitude, Father, that is in, in Christ Jesus. That we would choose to have the same attitude, emptying ourselves, ridding ourselves of selfish things, Lord, and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill our lives, Lord, with a confident strength, Lord Jesus, that only you can do so that we can do your will on this earth. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus and you say, I would like to give my life to the Lord today. I know that my life is not right with Him. Maybe you're in compromise. Maybe you're away from the Lord. Maybe you've never received Jesus. And today you want to give your life to Jesus. I'd love the opportunity to pray with you. If that's you in any way, would you just slip your hand up where you are? I won't embarrass you. Anybody today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you that everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, that everyone here. Lord, has just admitted, God, that they are right with you. So I pray that you take this word and that you remind us, Lord, 
Remind us of our need for you, Jesus. That we're empowered and we are strengthened by the Holy Spirit, Lord. But that we have to recognize it and we have to choose to walk in it. So I pray that you do that for us today. I pray you do that this week in our jobs, Lord, in our, in our homes, Father, in our, in our schools, Father, in those places where we're dealing with people that are not easy to love, not easy to work with, not easy to live with, Lord. I pray you remind us, have this attitude, have the attitude of Christ, humble yourself, and allow the Holy Spirit to have his work. Help us to clothe ourselves with humility, Jesus. Knowing that you'll give us that confident strength to walk day by day. In the name of Jesus, we love you, Lord. With our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we love you. And we love others, God. In the name of Jesus, amen.